Good morning, welcome back, Organic Chemistry 2341. Uh, We're here at eight o'clock in the morning on a, on a Thursday. And we're gonna continue on with uh, module eight, which is the reactions of alkenes. We should also get through the reactions of alkynes today and maybe even start chapter nine, which is NMR spectroscopy and mass spectroscopy, okay. Uh, I'm going to be assigning our group activity next, fr next Tuesday to be work on it by yourself for a week and you'll have a whole week to do it. And it's going to be that way so we can have that extra uh, lecture, that extra bit of time to make sure we can cover all of chapter 11 without rushing too much. So that's what I, I'm going to do. And again, the group activity is just something, you know, participation is most of it, turning something in is most of it. But this group activity, and I'll explain it on Tuesday, will also help you study for the final. So I think that's why I want to get it done a little early and get you kind of started on it. Uh, and we can continue with that. Okay. So let's continue on with chapter eight. We were talking about reactions of alkenes and we had just finished ozonolysis. And with ozonolysis, we know that we can work it up a couple different ways. And we sh I showed you a little trick on how to figure out what your products are based on whether you have a reductive workup, which is something that will take away that extra oxygen, or an oxidative workup, which is something where you're gonna add the oxygen and con convert any aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. So now let's move on to a different time uh, of adding of the uh, HBr to a double bond. Most of the time when we do this, it goes Markovnikov, meaning the bromine shows up on the more substituted uh, carbon, right? And the hydrogen is on the less substituted carbon, okay? That's because of the stability of the carbocation. However, if we change the mechanism from a carbocation mechanism to a, a radical mechanism, then we can change the way it adds across the double bond. It'll add across anti-Markovnikovs. The bromine is gonna be on the less substituted side, okay? So that being said, wh why does this work? Well, it has everything to do with the, for the fact that we're gonna be forming a radical instead of a carbocation first. All right, so when, and we're gonna have a whole chapter on radicals, it's chapter 10, and uh, so, but I wanna introduce the concept here. A radical is when you, instead of breaking a bond heterolytically where one atom, the more electronegative atom takes away both electrons, it breaks homolytically. So each atom takes away a single electron. This is really common in the oxygen-oxygen bond. It's not a very stable bond and they're both the same electronegativity. So instead of one taking both electrons, they each take an electron, which gives us an unpaired electron. And that's what we have a free radical, okay? Now, the most common way to do that is with things like peroxides here. We can use hydrogen peroxide or uh, some of these organic peroxides are much more soluble in organic solvents. So they're used a lot. And uh, uh, dibenz wheel peroxide is also used extensively as well. Now, you choose those different things because they decompose at different temperatures. And so you can run the reaction at different temperatures by choosing your peroxide. Okay. so. Why do we want to use the free radical? Well, because when we use the free radical, the free radical is also going to be on the most stable, most substituted carbon. The like carbocations, the radicals are stabilized through that hyperconjugation, which means when we add a radical to a, um, a, a double bond, we end up with the free radical. The free radical is going to be on the more substituted carbon. Okay, so just like in a carbocation, it's the carbocation is going to be the more substituted carbon. We want to generate the radical on the more substituted carbon. And the way this works is the idea that we're going to create a bromine radical that attacks first. And if the bromine radical is attacking first, it's going to be on the least substituted carbon because the radical formed on the carbon is going to be on the more substituted carbon. So let's take a look at the different steps possible here. Okay. So the first thing that has to happen when we have a, a, free, a free radical mechanism is we have to initiate the reaction, okay? In this case, we're taking a peroxide and we're breaking it apart and one electron from the sigma bond goes to one of the oxygens and one of the electrons from the sigma bond goes to the other oxygen and we generate two equivalents 
of oxygen radical. Okay, so then the oxygen radical can react with the HBr and again break that bond apart homolytically such that one electron from here goes and makes an alcohol out of our former oxygen radical and that liberates bromine as a neutral species with an unpaired electron. It has a total of seven electrons around it. It's happy as far as charge balance, but it still makes it very reactive having that unpaired electron. Okay, so this is how we generate our active species, which is that bromine radical. Now, when that bromine radical comes in uh, proximity to the double bond, a couple things can happen, okay? This is what we call the propagation reaction. And the reason we call it a propagation reaction is that when you add your first radical, you generate another radical, okay? So there, there, it generates another radical that has to react with something else to continue on the reaction. Okay. So there's two ways this bromine can interact with our double bond. Our double bond is the most active bond, so it's gonna interact with that first. The first thing that can happen is we can have one of the electrons from the double bond, whoa, See that my mistake there, I did a double pronged arrow. Whenever we move a single electron, we use a single pronged arrow, okay? So we wanna make sure we do that. Uh, so one of the electrons is going to make the new sigma bond with the one electron from bromine. So notice that one of these came from the bromine and one of these came from the double bond, okay? In, if it attacks this way, that remaining electron has to go and reside on the atom, giving us our carbon radical here. Now notice this carbon radical is on the more stable site, just like a carbocation, it's on the tertiary site, so it's more stable. What if it did it the other way? Well, if it did it the other way where it reacted with one of the electrons of the bromine and it left the radical on the outermost, so we have the same sigma bond forming, but now we have a primary radical, that's the less stable radical, okay? So it will preferentially add to the outer less substituted carbon, giving us our more stable radical. Okay. So then what can happen next is, well, we have to get rid of that uh, radical on our um, carbon substrate here. So to get rid of that radical, it can go and interact with another equivalent HBr take one electron from that sigma bond to create our sigma bond with hydrogen, and it regenerates a bromine radical that can react again, okay? So this is why we also call a prop propagation step because even though we're making a neutral non-radical species, we also made a radical species that can then go and attack again. And this keeps going and going and going and going until you run out of things to react with. And then you end up with what we call the termination step. That's where we get rid of all the radicals. So in termination step, that means that whatever radicals you have are going to recombine and give some kind of product. So one of the ways it can do it is if you run out of HBr and all you have is bromine radical, it can react with that remaining substrate and give you a dimeromal compound. Okay. Again, this doesn't happen until the very end of the reaction. So there's a very small amount of these things when they're, that are generated. The other thing that can happen is two bromine radicals can terminate and two of the R groups can terminate. All three of those are byproducts to the reaction, but the major product of the reaction is the uh, bromine on the anti Markovnikov's carbon, the less substituted carbon, okay? So now we have a way of doing an addition reaction with HBr where we put the bromine on the more substituted carbon or we can put it on the less substituted carbon. All right, questions on this anti markovnikovs method. So the key takeaway here is that you're generating a radical. The radical wants to be on the most substituted carbon and the bromine's attacking first. So since the bromine's attacking first, it's going to be on the least substituted carbon. And then when you get rid of or terminate your more stable radical, you end up with your final product. Okay. All right. So let's review everything we talked about. Okay. So this is where you want to kind of get our uh, a reaction table or something kind of down.
and look at the reactions and make sure you know what the mechanisms are, okay? So uh, if we look at um, hydrohalogenation, adding an acid across there, because we go through a carbocation uh, intermediate, we get both syn and anti-addition, okay? Because that carbocation, the other thing we can get is carbocation rearrangement. So we can have a mixture of products there. So that's an important thing to remember. Uh, hydrolysis, acid catalyzed hydrolysis, also goes through a carbocation intermediate and it gives us syn and anti-addition and it can also go undergo rearrangement, okay? So we have to be very careful about what substrates we use when we do these if we want a specific product. When we go with halogenation, we only get anti-addition because we form that three-membered ring with the colonium cation and the other, the nucleophile has to come in from the other side, so you only get anti. You have the same thing with the halo-hydrogen reaction. The halogen reacts first, and then the water comes in and reacts as the nucleophile, so you only get anti. In the case of boron, because you form a four-membered transition state and add the boron to the least substituted carbon and the hydrogen to the more substituted carbon, you only get syn addition. But then, of course, you have to oxidize it off. So that second step is required to remove that boron to get to your alcohol. Okay, in the oxymercurization, demercurization, remember, we're using the mercury is going to end up on the least substituted carbon. Or, uh, yeah, and so we actually end up getting a mixture of syn and anti. So make sure you know that mechanism. In the osmium tetroxide, because it's adding at the same time and forming that five-membered ring, it's syn addition. Because in hydrogenation, it adds across a surface, it's also syn addition. And then, of course, if we just try to oxidize it with permanganate, we actually don't end up with the, uh, the uh, alkene at all. We end up with a dicarboxylic acid. And actually, I just realized that's wrong. We should be acids. Okay. All right, so those are all the reactions we have available to us. We have about five different mechanisms for the different rearrangements. The last thing that we just talked about is the anti Markovnikov's one, where we can get it where we have, it's going to be a mixture of syn and anti addition as well, but it's going to be that anti Markovnikov's product. All right, questions on alkene reactions. Not on mute, am I? Okay. Just checking. Okay, we're going to move on to our alkyne reactions. Okay, so in our alkyne reactions, it's going to be a lot of the same reactions, except we have two pi bonds to deal with. So we have to figure out what's going to happen. Are we just going to add one equivalent in there? Are we going to add two equivalents in there? Is there a reactivity difference? So there's some of the same reactions, but we have to pay attention to the fact that we have those two things. Okay, so <clears throat> much of the chemistry of these alkynes is associated also with the acidity. If you have a hydrogen at the end of the alkyne, remember that's the most acidic hydrogen. So we have some new reactions available to us because of that acidity. But most of the addition reactions are very similar to the alkenes. Okay, so just to refresh our memories, we have a sigma bond in the middle. We have a pi bond in uh, 90 degrees out of that and another pi bond 90 degrees out of that. Most of the time, they are, uh, uh, they, it, acetylene itself can be a gas, but then after they get higher, they get up to uh, be liquids. Right here. Um, to synthesize an alkyne, it's kind of like synthesizing a, um, uh, uh, an alkene, except you have to have two halogens, one on each, well, well, you have to have two halogens and two hydrogens to remove to get to the alkyne. So as we talked about when we talked about acids and bases, the sp3 hybridized carbons have the least acidic hydrogens. Once we have the sp2 hybridized, they have a little more S character, and so they're a little more acidic. By the time we get here, it has half S character and half P character, and it becomes the most acidic of our hydrocarbons. Okay, so with that, we can use a base to pull it off. And once we do that, we now have a carbanion, 
which is a strong nucleophile. Okay. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mute my watch. My phone is muted though. Okay. So when we think about alkynes, if you have a hydrogen on there, you have to make sure you are not using a very strong base or you're gonna deprotonate that alkyne and use it as a nucleophile instead. In fact, if you do see a strong, okay, uh, admitting somebody to, okay, all right, there we go. Okay, if you do see a strong base like uh, amide, a sodium amide, you are probably gonna be deprotonating that acetylene and using it as a nucleophile. Okay, so in the case of things like this, where we have one proton on there that we can remove, we use a very strong base called sodium amide or butyl lithium. In the case of butyl lithium, we have a negative charge on carbon, a positive, mostly negative charge on carbon, mostly positive charge on lithium. And that sp2 hybridized carbon wants that proton more than the sp hybridized carbon, and therefore it can fully remove that in the system. And if we look at the reaction with sodium amide, we typically do it in a solvent like ammonia, and it will create this nucleophile right here. And so we can make a new carbon-carbon bond by attacking things with this negative charge here as a nucleophile. And these are mostly in equilibrium, although they are fairly well shifted to the uh, weaker base side. Okay, so once we form that, we now can do SN2 reactions using it as a nucleophile. Okay, so any alkyl halide can be attacked by that acetylene to create a new carbon-carbon bond. We can also use it as a nucleophile on carbonyl compounds and it'll react just like every other nucleophile, except in the case of this, we're gonna create a, in the case of having a ketone here, well, right here, we're gonna create the alkoxide ion, and then we'd have to add acid or water to protonate that at the end. So in the case of this, we're adding water at the end, and we're gonna end up with our uh, tertiary alcohol on it. So let's actually do it with an acetylene so you can look at the structure of the compound here. So in this, we're gonna take sodium amide and we're going to remove that proton. And that is now our nucleophile. It's gonna attack, of course, the carbon center. And in this case, what we've done is we've taken whatever the acetylite is and we've added one carbon to it. And we now have a primary alcohol after we protonate it here. Notice that we're using formaldehyde. So it's a, the one that will make a primary alcohol. If you used an aldehyde, another aldehyde, it would make a secondary alcohol. And if you used a ketone, you're gonna make a tertiary alcohol, just like we did with all the other nucleophiles we did. Okay. So from this here, you can actually take uh, just acetylene by itself, which is a gas, react it with formaldehyde, which is also a gas, and you can make a two propyne one all, which is a liquid because of hydrogen bonding. Okay, so we see how we can use the acetylene, use the acidity of that proton to use it as a nucleophile. Note, if your alkyne is in the middle of a chain, there is no hydrogen and it cannot react as a nucleophile. It must have a hydrogen on one or both ends of the acetylene. Okay, so let's talk about actually making the alkynes. When we make the alkynes, we typically use a very strong base like sodium amide or butyl lithium. And there's also some other uh, nitrogen containing uh, things. And we'll talk about LDA uh, about uh, using that. But the key is you have to have at least two hydrogens and two carbons, sorry, two hydrogens and two halogens to remove, okay? Now they can be either one. You could have uh, a one, two, dibromo compound. And we call that a vicinal dihalide because they're on adjacent carbons, okay? Or you can have them both on the same carbon. They're both on the one carbon here. When they're both on the same carbon, we call that geminal. 
Gemini meaning twin, so they're all both on the same carbon, visceral meaning in the uh, vicinity of. So, but either way, you have to have two halogens there because the first step is going to be removing one of them to create the first double bond, like an alkene. The second step is going to be removing the other one to give you this second pi bond. Okay. So, and it typically goes in an E2 fashion stepwise, okay? So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna use your base. You're gonna to try to arrange your uh, configuration so you're in that staggered anti-conformation. Your hydrogen has to be anti to your bromine so that you can create a good uh, concerted reaction forming your double bond. Then once you do that, you have to use, another, again, a very strong base to get the second one to come in and leave the exact same way. Notice when we did this with a regular alkyl halide, we can make this step happen with just a strong base like alkoxide or hydroxide. However, this proton is not acidic enough to react with that. That's why we have to use a much stronger base. Okay, that's why we have to use the sodium amide or the butyl lithium. It will, this less acidic proton will not react with the weaker bases. Okay. So when you see that, you need to make sure that you're using the very strong base to be able to make the alkyne. Okay. So, and then when we do this, it all depends on your configuration on where your, your R groups are. If your R groups are opposite each other in this staggered configuration, you're gonna end up with your Z isomer. And if you're in the, uh, where you have your R groups both on the same side in the staggered configuration, you're gonna end up with the E isomer, okay? And just like before, where we're trying to get in the staggered conformation, the Z isomer is much, much faster because the hydrogen is um, opposite or, you know, uh, in the trans configuration to the, the bromine leaving, and it's a much faster reaction. So the other one will go, but remember, this is not a favored reaction. It's gonna take a little more time. It's got a higher activation energy and it's a slower reaction. But luckily they both give the exact same product. All right. Questions on that? Okay, let's see what here, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about what we can do to an alkyne. We've had an alkyne, we've made an alkyne, we've used that proton on the end of the alkyne to make it a nucleophile, okay? But like the uh, reactions with the alkenes, we can also add things across it, okay? So if you have one equivalent of your acid, you can add that one equivalent across your acid and it'll add in a Markovnikov's fashion, okay? So what that means is the bromine's gonna be on the more substituted carbon. Okay, so let's take a look at that. If we have exactly one equivalent of this, it'll add across it so the bromine is on the more substituted carbon and it'll give us our alkene from that, okay? Uh, I don't like that they put the hydrogen here. I think uh, the hydrogen will probably be there. It doesn't really matter because they're equivalent, but we should pay attention to where it adds. So the basic idea is that we have the alkene is acting as the nucleophile because it has the double bond. The hydrogen is acting as the electrophile because it's got the more positive charge. And when the first reaction happens, we generate a alkenyl cation or a vinyl cation that is then attacked by the bromine, which is our new nucleophile and we end up with our final product here. So in the case of this, it actually can also happen at exactly the same time because uh, that uh, alkenyl cation is not very stable. And therefore, if you have uh, floating around in solution two acids in close proximity, they can actually kind of, one's donating the hydrogen, one's donating the halogen and you end up transitioning to a substitution product plus another equivalent of your acid. They can go off and react again. 
Okay. Why did I stress the idea that you have to have just one equivalent of the hydrogen bromide to get to the alkene? Well, we've added hydrogen bromide across alkenes before, right? So if we have a second equivalent of an alkene, it's going to add across that double bond, okay? But there's regiochemistry to pay attention to, okay? So in the case of our terminal alkene here, when we add our first equivalent of HBr, we have a hydrogen on the less substituted side, a bromine on the more substituted side, okay? And if we only had one equivalent, it would stop there. However, if we add one more equivalent, that's also gonna add just like with the alkene, and it will also add in the Markovnikov's method, where the bromine is gonna be on the more substituted carbon. So both bromines are gonna end up on the more substituted carbon. Both hydrogens are gonna end up on the less substituted carbon. Okay. So what if we did that in the middle of something where it's equivalent? Well, let's look at this right here, where we have methyl groups at the ends and that all kind of the middle. The first step is gonna be the same, where we're gonna create uh, an addition product and a carbocation that is then gonna be reacting with the bromine here. Once we form this right here, now the bromine is acting as something other than hydrogen. So it's the more substituted carbon at this time. So the second equivalent will do the same thing where we're getting get it into a transition state where the carbocation is stabilized by the lone pairs on the bromine, okay? So with this, the carbocation is adjacent to the bromine, it's stabilized by that lone pair. It's the more stable resonance structure and therefore the bromine adds to the exact same carbon the bromine was already on. So when we look at this, our regiochemistry is first equivalent adds across and then that directs the second bromine to add on that same carbon. So remember, we call these geminal dihalides. So if you react two moles of HBr with an alkyne, you get a geminal dibromide. And it's all because that carbocation is stabilized by the lone pair on the bromine. All right, questions on that? Okay, so if we have just one equivalent, we can stop right at the alkene. If we have two equivalents, we're gonna get a geminal dihalide. Okay, so what if we added just a halogen across it? Well, uh, well, we'll probably just add the first one across the double bond and then in a anti-configuration. Then we're gonna add the second equivalent across the double bond in an anti-configuration as well, okay? So when we look at this, we can say, okay, there we go. Okay, for the most part, it looks like it's mostly anti with a little bit of sin addition. Wait, hold it. It's anti-addition, oh yeah, yeah. So you can get both isomers here. Notice the bromines that are opposite each other here is the higher, um, has the, is the highest yielding of one of the, it's the major product, that's what I meant to say. But the cis is available to us because of the intermediate configuration. But when you add the second equivalent to it, it'll uh, take it out all the way down to the tetra halo compound. So you have two chlorides on one carbon and two chlorides on the second carbon. All right, so we can add HBr across it, just like with an alkene. We can add chlorine across it, just like an alkene, but we have two different steps we can use. We can choose one equivalent or two equivalents for that. So let's talk about hydrogenation, okay? So in the case of hydrogenation, if you used palladium, platinum, or nickel with hydrogen, just like an alkene, what's, it, what's gonna happen is it's never gonna stop at the alkene, okay? Because the alkene is just reactive to that catalytic hydrogenation as the alkyne is. And so it'll maybe make a little bit, but it'll immediately be consumed and take it all the way down to the hydrocarbon. So if you wanna go all the way down to the hydrocarbon, you go ahead and just use palladium with, uh, or platinum or nickel. However, if you want to stop at the alkene, 
you must use what we call Lindlier's catalyst. Lindlier's catalyst is when we take the palladium and poison it, okay? We poison it with uh, uh, lead or quinoline. In this case, we're using barium sulfate. And when we poison the catalyst, the catalyst loses some of its reactivity, okay? So it's active enough to reduce down a double bond. I'm sorry, it's active enough to reduce down a triple bond, but not active enough to reduce down a double bond. <clears throat> so we can take our alkyne and stop at our alkene. The other thing to note here is that it also does sin addition, just like with the uh, alkene, because again, we still have the surface of a catalyst that we have to come down, it's just not as active. So we still get the syn addition, which means we always get the Z or cis configuration of our compounds. Do we see why we have to poison our catalyst to stop at the alkene? And do we see why it's still a, a syn addition? Okay, all right. So there's another way to do it and it'll give you a different isomer because we go through a different mechanism, okay? In the case of the dissolving metal reduction, what we're gonna be doing is actually transferring electrons from a sodium metal and it's gonna go down to something, uh, to a sodium salt. And in the process, we've actually changed the mechanism and it always produces the trans alkene. Notice Lindlier, because it's a syn addition, always creates the cis alkene. And if you wanted the trans alkene, you have to do the dissolving metal reduction. Okay, so, okay, I get why it's cis addition because we're coming on the surface of a catalyst and it can only add that way, okay? But why can we get the trans alkene with the dissolving metal reduction, okay? The reason is we're gonna end up going through a carbanion, okay? The way we do this is we're gonna take one electron from sodium and give it to the triple bond. In the case of giving it to the triple bond, number one, it's gonna add another electron to the carbon, giving it a negative charge. And we're gonna end up with this radical here, okay? Because we've added one electron from sodium to the system. We're gonna end up with a lone pair right here and a negative charge and a radical. Remember, anytime you just have one electron, you're always gonna have that electron there. Okay. So now we have that and it's going to be in the trans configuration because this is a big orbital here, this is a big orbital here, and they're gonna to wanna to be as far apart from each other as possible. So the intermediate forces those R groups to be trans to each other, okay? So the next step is that because we're using the, the, the sodium in ammonia, the ammonia can be deprotonated by the very strong base. It's, this is a very strong base. It's a, a negative, it's an sp2 hybridized carbon with a charge on it. And when it does that, it generates our alkenal radical. And now that our double bond has reformed, it's locked in that position, okay? We're locked in this trans configuration here. Then the next thing that happens is we have to create another anion here. And because the triple, the double bond's still fixed, it doesn't rearrange. It acts as a base again and removes another proton from the ammonia, giving us our trans alkene. Okay, so this is important. If you look at your product and it is a cis alkene from an alkyne, you wanna use Lindler's catalyst. Quinoline, palladium, barium sulfate. If you look at your product and it's a trans alkene and you're starting with an alkyne, you have to use the dissolving metal reduction, which is sodium metal in ammonia. So the cool thing is they call it dissolving metal because as soon as it, uh, as soon as it transfers its proton, it becomes a salt and then it dissolves away as sodium amide. And so the, the, the pellets of the sodium slowly dissolve into the solution. And that's kind of why they call it that. Okay, so do you see the mechanisms are very different and that's how we arrive at our cis for our lin layers and our trans for our dissolving metal reduction. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, okay, we added water across an alkene. 
what happens if we add water across an alkyne? Okay, well, it's similar, but it takes a little bit more force. We have to use a catalyst of mercury on here to get it to uh, kind of uh, stop where we want it. In the case of adding water across the alkenes, what we'll end up with is our intermediate of, let's just say we added water across here. We got OH on this side and then H on that side. We end up with an enol, okay? An enol is an alkene with an OH attached. Unfortunately, well, or fortunately, enols are always in um, equilibrium with the carbonyl compound associated with. We're gonna transfer this hydrogen over here and regenerate our carb and, and generate a carbonyl compound. And it's mostly in the ketone form. Even though it's in equilibrium, as soon as we add water across here, it gives us our enol, which immediately transfers mostly there and a little bit back. Okay, so what does that mean? It means if you have an internal, uh, if you have a internal alkyne, you're going to get a ketone in there. But if you have a terminal alkyne, one with a hydrogen on it, you still get a ketone because it preferentially adds the oxygen to the more substituted side, okay? Do we see that that goes by a, um, it adds to the more substituted side just like it's a Makovnikov's add, okay? So let's, we're not exactly sure of the mechanism, but we know mercury is required for this thing. So the proposed mechanism is the mercury reacts with the alkene to create that mercury uh, salt, just like in the oxymercurization, demercurization reaction, okay? But it's not exactly equal, right? So the more substituted carbon is gonna have the longer bond, and that's the one that's going to be attacked by the nucleophile, in this case, water, okay? Now, when we lose the proton on that, we can then have our mercury with our positive charge here get displaced by hydrogen because we have it an acid now because this got became an acid when it's protonated and we end up with our enol but again the most important thing is our oxygen is always on the more substituted carbon because it's going to have a partial positive charge here and that's going to favor the substitution of the um this it'll this is, should be an h by the way it'll favor the substitution at the more substituted carbon. So we still get a ketone. We do not get an aldehyde on this. So in this addition of water across there, if when we have to use mercury, we will end up with a ketone. Okay. And if this was not in the center of the molecule, you'd end up with a mixture. Okay, questions on that? So it's kind of like we're uh, the alkenes where we're adding the water across, but the intermediate here, this alcohol intermediate is not stable and transition and, and converts to a more stable form, the ketone form. Yeah, if we have the, let's say we had an alkyne that looked like this, we're gonna get some of it on this, some of the ketone on that one, and some of the ketone on that one because they're both disubstituted. So we're going to end up with a ketone like this and a ketone like this. So we're going to have a methyl ketone or an ethyl ketone because they're equivalent. There's no favored there. This one might be a slightly favored because of sterics, but really that's all we have. Okay, electronically they're identical. Okay, so... <clears throat> We can, however, re if we have a simple, um, if we have acetylene, we can actually get to the aldehyde because it'll add to one side and we still end up with the aldehyde on the other. Okay. Um, in this case, we never actually isolate the enol. It always isomerizes back to the ketone. And this is something we're gonna talk about a lot next next year, I mean, in the next uh, class, when we talk about aldehydes and ketones, we're gonna talk about enol keto tautomerism, meaning that it's mostly in the carbonyl form, but it does form a little bit of the enol form, which is the 
alkene with an alcohol on it. Okay. And these can be acid or base catalyzed. All right. So, well, we added boron to an alkene. Let's add boron to an alkyne. Okay. And it's going to end up doing some of the same things we did with the addition of water. Okay. So, we can use a wide variety of these boronating agents. Notice we're using different boron agents right here. Okay. We're using ones with just one hydrogen on. Okay. Remember, if we use borane, BH3, it reacts three times with the alkenes to create that intermediate. And then we have to oxidize off that carbon boron bond. Okay. In the case of an alkyne, to make it stop at just a mono addition, we want to use a boron with only one hydrogen on it. And it's going to do the same thing. It's going to do a syn addition and the boron is going to sit on the least substituted carbon, just like before. And um, the two most common ones are this uh, Sia borane right here. And the other one you'll see a lot is 9-BDN, 9-BDN. It's the bicyclo. And so that, when you see those reagents on the uh, uh, homework, you'll recognize them as having a boron with one hydrogen on them, and you're probably going to react with the alkyne. All right, we're going to go with this syn addition, and a boron's going to be on the less substituted, least substituted carbon. Then when we oxidize this off, we'll end up with an alcohol on that least substituted carbon. But because of enol keto tautomerism, it's going to convert to the carbonyl compound, in this case, an aldehyde. Okay. So in that other reaction where we're adding water, we're going to get the OH on the more substituted carbon, giving us ketones. The only way to get to our least substituted carbon is to anti Markovnikov's the addition. And that way, we can get the alcohol on the least substituted. And then through enol keto tautomerism, we get the carbonyl compound, our aldehyde. I, th I think if you use just acetylene itself, you can get to an aldehyde, but if it's substituted at all, it gives you a ketone. Okay. Okay. One of the other things we did with alkenes is we used ozonolysis to clip that uh, double bond. We can use that exact same thing, except it clips the triple bonds to give carboxylic acids. Okay, so if you have a symmetrical um, alkyne, it'll give you two equivalents of that same carboxylic acid. If you have an unsymmetrical alkyne, in this case, it's going to give you this right here. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So we're going to have pentanoic acid. And then we're going to have an acid with the one carbon, which is methonic acid or formic acid. Notice that hydrogen and this carbon are the end here. And we turned it into a carboxylic acid. These other five carbons, one, two, three, four, five, five carbons here, are from the other side of it with a carboxylic acid. And notice it's kind of the same thing where we typically add ozone, and then we add some kind of water here. This is done to that water is actually where we get the uh, hydrogen and the uh, the extra oxygen for the carboxylic acid. Okay. Um, again, with the alkenes, we can react with permanganate, but in if we do it in neutral conditions, so it's not basic. Remember, if we used basic permanganate with an alkene, uh, an alkene, it would break it apart and turn it into two carboxylic acids. If we use neutral conditions, we can oxidize both carbons to give us an intermediate, which is a diol right here. And again, this isn't very stable. And so what's going to happen is it's going to lose one equivalent of water on this side and form a carbonyl, and one equivalent of water on this side and form another carbonyl. So you actually end up with a diketone compound. So if you have an internal triple bond, and you're doing permanganate in neutral conditions, pH seven, then you get to this oxidized product that through enol um, uh, will lose water to give us our diketone. However, if it's a terminal alkyne, you end up with a carboxylic acid and a ketone. 
Again, it has to be in neutral conditions. Okay, questions on that. So see, the reactions are similar to the system, but we have to pay attention to the fact that we have two pi bonds to play with. And so sometimes we can stop by just reacting one pi bond, and sometimes we can't. All right. So what if we ran that in basic conditions? Okay. Well, if we ran it in basic conditions, it's going to do what we thought it was going to do. It's going to clip the triple bond and give us two carboxylic acids in their salt form because we're in bases here. And then if we acidify it, we'll end up getting our carboxylic acid. And if it's terminal alkyne, that creates this formic acid, which then will oxidize down to carbonate ion. And when carbonate ion forms, it actually forms carbonic acid and then it decomposes to CO2 and water. So in the case of this, if we have a terminal alkyne and we cut that off, we'll end up with one product and one product only and CO2 gas. But if we have an unsymmetrical one, we're gonna end up with both carboxylic acids. If we clip it here, just like we did with the alkenes, we wanna put our oxygen on this side, oxygen on this side, and then an OH on this side to show that we have that oxidized. And then that shows you what products you have. Okay. So similar reactions, we have to pay attention to the extra pi bond. All right, questions on reactions of alkynes. So on Tuesday, I'm gonna show you how to get a reaction table. And with that, you're gonna look at what kind of substrate you have, what kind of reagent you have, maybe a, 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 a thing for the type of mechanism it has, like does it go through a carbocation or does it go through, in the case of the permangate, it's gonna do a, a syn addition and then giving you a diol and then another syn addition, giving you a tetraol, et cetera. And then you'll know syn addition, anti-addition, and then what the products should be. All right, uh, if there's no questions, I'm gonna move on to module nine. Okay, let's clear our heads for a minute. Okay, we're moving on to something completely different, okay? We had all these reactions with alkenes and alkynes, and luckily they followed a lot of the same mechanisms. Now, I'm going to continue on with spectroscopy. We start with IR spectroscopy. IR spectroscopy was all about individual bonds absorbing light energy. And when they absorb light energy, we saw that that functional group or that type of bond was present in our molecule, okay? NMR spectroscopy adds to that. NMR spectroscopy adds to that by telling you how the carbons are hooked together or how many hydrogens are nearby. So that's gonna give another layer of information to our structural analysis. Mass spectrometry is going to tell us the mass of our compound. Okay, so we don't have to say, well, is it, you know, is it a five carbon chain or a 10 carbon chain? We know immediately that how many carbons we have because it tells us the mass of the compound. Okay, so let's remind ourselves about the nucleus of an atom. Okay, in the nucleus of an atom, there are um, uh, protons and neutrons, right? And if there's an, if they're in there and they're spinning really fast, if they're spinning really fast, they end up with a pole, okay? There's gonna be a positive and negative pole just like the Earth's spinning, okay? So the, the, the protons and neutrons are spinning around really fast and they all have poles, okay? So at any one time in the atom, they just are randomly pulled everywhere. However, if you put them into a high magnetic field, they're going to align with that magnetic field. They're gonna align with it where all the poles are pointing in the same direction, or some of them can be in a slightly higher energy state where the poles are still parallel, but they are in the opposite direction. And so we call it a parallel, which is the low energy state. And the anti-parallel, they're held that way because of the magnetic field, but it's a higher energy state because it's in the reverse order. Okay, so 
we have a molecule. And then if we take that molecule and we put it in a high magnetic field, we're going to be able to tell the difference between the different types because we're going to have them all lined up. Okay. So let's say you have it and you have it uh, in this uh, magnetic field and then you hit it with some energy so that you excite some of these low energy into the anti-parallel. Okay. So we have to hit it with something. And in this case, we're going to use radio frequency, radio frequencies to flip some of them up. So these are in a high energy state and most of them, I mean, some of them are going to still be in a low energy state, some of them are going to be in a high energy state, but that is a high energy state. And what's going to happen is they're going to lose energy and relax back down. When they relax back down, the, the different times it takes to relax tells us the position on the NMR chart. The longer it takes for those to relax, the further and further down field we get. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain that phrase in a minute. But the idea here is we're waiting for these things to slowly relax back. So let's say one carbon will relax in one second and a different kind of carbon is gonna relax in five seconds. So we'll be able to see the difference between the different types. Okay, so, so what we're looking for is we put these things on high magnetic field, we hit them with electromagnetic energy, and we wait for them to relax. And the time it takes to relax is all about their individual, the each atom's electronic configuration around it. So in proton NMR, there are four things we pay, pay attention to. And you can do a spin is one way to remember that. We look at the number of signals we have. The number of signals we have tells us how many unique types of hydrogen we have, okay? We look at the intensity of the signals. Now, we don't just measure the height of the signal, we actually measure the area under the curve of the signal. And I'll show you how to do that. We look at the position of the signal. So the position is moving along the X axis. The further away we get from zero, the longer it took to relax, okay? And then the last thing we're gonna look at is spin-spin coupling. And that is if you have hydrogens here and you have hydrogens within three bonds of this hydrogen, that will split your signal, okay? So that's what we're gonna look for in our things. There's gonna be four things we look for on every proton in the mark. Okay, so why do I say proton in R? Well, hydrogen, is uh, the most common isotope of hydrogen is hydrogen one. It has one proton, no neutrons, okay? One of the things about NMR spectroscopy is you have to have an odd number of protons and neutrons in your thing. So all of your isotopes that have a good NMR spectrum are typically odd in number. So uh, hydrogen has only one proton, it's the major isotope, so it's really, really common and it's really easy to use. Okay. So let me describe the different parts of the NMR spectrum that we have for proton NMR. It's, it's hydrogen, but we call it proton NMR. Okay. So in the case of our NMR, we have number one, the different types of hydrogen. So the number of signals, okay? So in this case here, these two hydrogens are different than these three hydrogens because these two hydrogens are next to a bromine. These three hydrogens are just next to a carbon. So that means they're different, okay? So they're not gonna have the exact same relaxation time, meaning they're gonna be shifted differently and we're gonna have two peaks for those two different types of hydrogen, okay? So that's the first thing. The th second thing is we're looking at if we took and if we added up all the area under the curve, the relative ratio between these two peaks should represent the number of hydrogens we have, okay? So that's intensity, okay? The next thing is shift, okay? The longer it took to relax tells us something about what's bonded to the carbon with hydrogens on it, okay? Remember, we're talking about proton NMR, so we're talking about 
the hydrogens, the electronic environment those hydrogens are in. And that's done by what we call chemical shift. We start at zero, we have an internal standard. This is a tetramethylsilane, it's an internal standard. And the further shifting up from that zero, the more it, the longer it took to relax. And then the last thing is splitting. And if we didn't have any hydrogens nearby, we would have a single peak. If you have hydrogens three bonds away, the number of hydrogens you have three bonds away tells you how many times it's split. And we'll, we'll practice that in a bit. So that's what it looks like for those four different elements we're looking for. We're looking for number of peaks, we're looking for intensity of peaks, we're looking for the shift of the peaks, and we're looking for the splitting of the peaks. Okay, so let's talk about number of signals. Okay. Number of signals has to do with the number of different types of protons in our compound, okay? Not number of hydrogens in our compound, different types of hydrogens. Now, what do I mean by that? So we're gonna look for equivalent hydrogens, okay? So these three hydrogens bonded to this carbon generate a single signal because they're all the same. There's nothing different about those three hydrogens, okay? So those three hydrogens would generate a single signal, okay? However, so we have three hydrogens bonded to a carbon, bonded to an oxygen, okay? If we look at the other side here, we have three hydrogens bonded to a carbon, bonded to an oxygen. So they are the same electronically, right? Because they have the exact same attachments nearby. So that means we're gonna get this as a single signal for those hydrogens, and this is the same, so we're gonna get one NMR signal for that compound. Okay, Okay. maybe, maybe, all right. So now let's look at this one right here, okay. On this one, we're gonna get two different signals because we have these hydrogens are connected to a carbon, which is connected to a chlorine, and then connected to a carbon, okay? So that's what these hydrogens are. These hydrogens are connected to a carbon with two hydrogens on it, okay? Those are automatically different than the being connected to the carbon with three hydrogens on it and being connected to a chlorine. So that means they have a different electronic environment. Therefore, it's a different signal. So we end up with two different types of hydrogen in this compound. So we have two signals, all right? Let's take it and, and really, really, drive this home right here. In this one here, oh, I have that CH3 here. So this CH3 is gonna be the same as that CH3, right? Wait a minute. This CH3 is bonded to an oxygen. This CH3 is bonded to a carbon. So this CH3 is not equivalent to that CH3 and they each have their own signal. And this methyl group, this uh, methylene, this uh, carbon with two hydrogens on it is different than either of those methyl groups. So it has its own signal. Okay. Do we understand the idea of equivalency? So if they don't have the exact environment that the other things have, they are not equivalent and they have their own peak. Okay. So we have to think about a little bit when we talk about cyclics or, or alkenes, because if we draw it like this, we're gonna say, oh, well, we only have like one kind of hydrogen here, right? It's like, no, let's redraw it so that we have all the hydrogens present. This hydrogen's different than these two hydrogens. And these four hydrogens are different than that hydrogen. So we're probably gonna have two signals for that peak, not just one. The same thing for an alkene. If we look at this, we're gonna say, oh, well, they're all alkene hydrogens, or we're gonna have two different signals, right? One for this methyl group and one for this hydrogen. But wait, this hydrogen's next to this chlorine, so that's gonna be a different signal than this hydrogen, which is much further away from that chlorine, which is different than this one that is on the same carbon as the chlorine. So in this case here, we have three peaks. You would have said, oh, the CH2, that's one peak here. 
So it's better to draw it out. And then you have to look for even spatial interaction controls the, the uh, equivalency of the protons. Questions on that? Okay. All right, so let's practice figuring out chemical equivalencies on these different compounds here. Okay, so if we look at this, we, let's make sure we add our hydrogen back here. So we have a CH3 here, a CH3 here. Are they the same? I think they're different because this CH3 is next to a carbonyl and this CH3 is next to a carbon and hydrogen ion. Okay, so that means we have, okay, put my hydrogen back here. We have one signal for this type of methyl group. Okay, and we just determined that that one was different. So we have one signal for this methyl group. Okay, now, is this is uh, is there anything with just one hydrogen? On it? No. So this is one signal for this hydrogen. Okay. What do we do with this one? Okay. Let's look at its electronic environment. We have this carbon has a CH three, a carbonyl followed by a CH. This is a CH three by a carbonyl by a CH. These are equivalent. So we're going to get one blue peak for that, one green peak for this methyl group, and one red peak for there. So we're going to have a total of three peaks for this compound. Okay. So these two methyl groups are equivalent. So let's talk about this. How many peaks we're going to get? It's tetrahedral. It looks like 17 with the question mark. <laughs> but, uh, yes, you're going to get one peak because they're all equivalent. They're all bonded to the same carbon. They all see the same place. Okay. So how many peaks are we going to get on that? Okay. Again, it's one because this is a CH3 bonded to a carbon with three hydrogens. This is a CH3 bonded to a carbon with three hydrogens. We get another, we only get one peak from there. All right. If we look at this compound here, we end up with three peaks because this is the hydrogen bonded directly to the carbon with the chlorine on. These hydrogens are spatially next to a hydrogen and these hydrogens are spatially next to a chlorine, which means they have three signals by having that single chlorine on the um, cyclopropane. Okay, if we look at this one here, we start seeing symmetry again. And so we're gonna to start to see that we have, oh, the hydrogen on here and the hydrogen on here are equivalent. That's gonna be one peak, okay. These two hydrogens are gonna be equivalent to these two hydrogens because if we look at connectivity, they're gonna be the same. And these two hydrogens are gonna be the same as those two hydrogens because of connectivity. So we're gonna have three peaks for that compound as well. We might even have the peak, the hydrogen, well, let's see, they're going to be, it's in a, going to be a boat configuration, so they're going to be further away. So we probably won't see a splitting on those peaks. And when we look at this right here, we have that through space interaction here next to a hydrogen here, through space interaction here. So we're going to see three peaks for that compound. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about intensity. Okay. Intensity is gives you, if we look at the area under the curve, the relative ratio between one peak and the next is equivalent to the number of hydrogens that are there. Okay, so for example, in this compound here, we have three equivalent hydrogens, we have nine equivalent hydrogens, and because there's nothing nearby, they aren't splitting, so we have a single peak. Okay, so we don't measure the height of the peak, we measure the area under the curve because when we have multiple splittings, we can't just add up all the heights. We have to look at the area under the curve. So we do an integration. That's what this little thing here, it's imagining it's an integral. So it's integrating everything under that peak. And so if the relative intensity of this was 30, 333, and the relative intensity of this was 1000, that gives you a ratio of one to three 
Okay. We know we had three hydrogens here, so one times three is three hydrogens. Three times three is nine hydrogens. Okay. So we see that we integrate, and we take the area under that curve, and the ratio between the peaks tells you the number of hydrogens on each of those peaks. Okay. So we get a peak for each type of hydrogen, and the area under the curve is the relative ratio of the number of hydrogens in each peak. All right, so that's intensity. Now position, this one's going to be a little hard, but there's a kind of a, a, a thing to think about here is that you're going to be able to kind of predict this because as you add more electron density to a system, it's going to shift down field further up, further and further away from zero, higher and higher numbers. Okay, so downfield is higher numbers, upfield is closer to zero. Okay, so what's cool about this is that when we use our TMS, this is tetravethylsilane, as our internal standards, we always set that to zero. All of these hydrogens are equivalent. And because these carbons are bonded to the silicon, that silicon is uh, more electronegative and it's actually gonna take it further down than just being bonded to carbons. And so we call that zero, okay? Luckily, when we do carbon NMR, we're gonna call it zero as well. Okay. Now, if you take the observed frequency minus the reference and divide it by the frequency of the spectrophotometer, you'll end up with this number here, parts per million, okay? so. For example, if you did an experiment on a 60 megahertz NMR and you didn't divide it by the number of the spectrophotometer, you're gonna end up with, let's say your position was at 200 Hertz, okay? However, if you ran that same experiment on another machine that was higher in frequency, your position would be at 900 Hertz, 990 Hertz. You can't compare those two NMRs. But if you divide that observed peak from the uh, frequency of the machine, you get, you get what we call parts per million. So that means an experiment run on a 60 megahertz machine will give you the same PPMs as a 300 megahertz machine, which will give you the same uh, megahertz as a 500 megahertz machine. So this is how we kind of level the playing field from instrument to instrument by converting everything into PPM, parts per million. Okay, so the chemical shift is always leveled in parts per million. We typically start with zero at our TMS and it goes up from there. So it goes downfield the higher the number you get, upfield the lower number you get. And the difference between zero and the where the peak is, is what we call the chemical shift. Okay, so that's position, chemical shift. All right. So what causes downfield absorption? Okay, it's all about the electron density around that uh, hydrogen you're playing with. Okay, so in the case of a hydrogen that's bonded to a carbon, we're going to see it has a certain amount of electron density that electron density produces a, uh, a magnetic field of its own that's going to try to line up. Okay. So if we change the amount of electron density in that bond with hydrogen, we're going to change the uh, ability for it to um, produce its own magnetic field, and it's going to change its shift. Okay. So the idea here is that if we have carbon bonded to something electrons drawing group, it's gonna pull electron density away from that hydrogen. And it's gonna be called what we call de-shielded. Think about it as it's pulling electrons away. It is no longer shielding by those electrons and the peak shifts down field, higher numbers, okay? If we have something that's donating electron density that means we're getting more electrons to shield it. If more electrons are shielding it, it shifts up field 
closer to zero. Okay, so if we have something that's withdrawing electron density, we're going to start shifting it further and further to higher and higher PPMs. So we'll see that trend when we look at our positions that the more electronic drawing we have in a resonant structure or a, a single structure, the further and further it goes downfield. Okay. So, things that have uh, something, a more electronegative atom bonded near it or something with a partially positive charge are going to shift things downfield to higher numbers. If you have less donation, let's say you're bonded to a carbon, which is the same, has the same electronegativity as a carbon, you're going to be further upfield or closer to zero. Okay, so in the case here, we have these that are bonded directly to an oxygen and these that are bonded to a carbonyl, okay? So the carbonyl has that partially positive charge, but the oxygen's more electronegative. So these are gonna be further downfield than these, okay? Because there's less of a shielding effect on having the oxygen bonded next to it than having the carbonyl bonded. So we're gonna see their positions be different because that different shielding they have. Okay. So let's look at the chart and see how we can predict the general area where things are by what's bonded nearby. Okay. So things that only have carbons like hydrocarbons are going to be most like the carbon carbons are not withdrawing electron density, so they're gonna be closest to zero. And so if we have the CH3, CH2, and CH next to a carbon, if they're bonded to any carbon right there, or they have spaces out with carbons with hydrogens on them, we're gonna see them all in that zero to two range. If we add anything that has an electronegative atom to it, like a carbonyl, an acetylene, a sulfur, nitrogen, or an airing ring, that's the next band. It's gonna be between two and three, okay? So do you see we're having, you know, it being able to pull some of that electron density away with those groups. Now, if we have oxygen or a halogen directly bonded to those, that carbon, those hydrogens are gonna be shifted even higher in that three to five range. An alkene hydrogen, because of this, uh, the, the alkene, the, the, the pi bond here is gonna deshield it even more. It's gonna be in that five to seven range. The aromatic ring, because of aromaticity and because of the resonant structures, it shifted even higher. And then hydrogens on carbonyls, the aldehyde is nine and 10, and the hydrogen on a carboxylic acid is the highest above 10 to 12. Now, if we have a hydrogen bonded directly on a electronegative atom, it can shift around a lot. And it shifts around a lot because of hydrogen bonding, okay? If it's a high concentration, it can be uh, lower or higher than it's, uh, depending on its, its actual, is it bonding to the solvent? Is it hydrogen bonding to itself? So it shifts around quite a bit. So just by looking at what's bonded to it and looking for more and more electronegativity, we can see which groups are further downfield and we can get a relative idea of saying, oh, well, you know, there's only a carbonyl attached to it. It's gonna be just above a hydrocarbon. Oh, there's a halogen attached to it. It's gonna be above a carbonyl. Oh, it's an alkene. It's gonna be above one with a halogen on it. It's an aromatic ring, an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. So knowing the different ranges is important for this. Okay. All right, I got about five minutes left, right? Okay. So let's start talking about splitting. Okay. So that's the fourth thing. Number of peaks, that's how many unique hydrogens we have. The intensity, that's how many hydrogens are on each of the different types of hydrogen. Shift is all about the electronic structure around those hydrogens. And now we're talking about splitting. Equivalent protons do not split each other. That means all equivalent protons give one peak, okay? So we have one peak, okay? Now, 
After that, you count the number of non-equivalent protons three bonds or less away. Non-equivalent protons that are three bonds or less away, okay? And so let's say we had five of those. We have five non-equivalent protons that are three bonds or less away, and we have our single peak, so that's five plus one. And that means we're gonna have six peaks in our NMR. That, that, those equivalent protons will be split a total of six times. The splitting is observed for non-equivalent protons on the same or adjacent carbons. Okay, meaning that in that case of the cyclopropane, the two hydrogens that were on the bottom were different than the two hydrogens on the top because of the chlorine. That means they would split. So it's three bonds or less apart. So it can be two bonds, but it's typically three bonds. Okay, so let's talk about that. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Okay, we're gonna have non-equivalent hydrogens do, uh, 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 split each other. So in this case, our R groups are different enough that we have that hydrogen A here and hydrogen B are different, okay? We get one peak for hydrogen A, and let's say there are no hydrogens over here, and the only other hydrogen within three peaks is this hydrogen here. So what's gonna happen is that this one right here is going to split that one, and we're gonna end up with two peaks, one for the hydrogen itself, and then one for all of, the, one for the adjacent hydrogen, okay? And so basically, we'll see that happen for each and every hydrogen that's going to be non-equivalent, okay? And again, they're non-equivalent because of something electronic or spatial. And because they're non-equivalent, they're not gonna be in the same peak. Okay. okay, rules two and three, okay? You count the number of hydrogens within that many bonds. So in the case of this, we have hydrogen A, hydrogen A, hydrogen A here, and if we look at this peak, we're gonna get one peak for the hydrogen. And we have one, two, three bonds, one hydrogen, one, two, three, two hydrogens. So that's gonna be our plus two is gonna be equal to three. This hydrogen is gonna be split into three peaks, okay? And notice the intensity is the, the middle is a little bit higher than the two outsides. So let's look at those other hydrogens. These B hydrogens are equivalent to each other, but they're not equivalent to this. So we have one hydrogen within three peaks away from the B. So we have one peak for the B hydrogens plus one for the number of hydrogens within three bonds, meaning that the Bs are gonna be split into two peaks or what we call a doublet, okay? So a single peak is a singlet, a double peak is a doublet, a triple peak is a triplet, quartet, pentet, heptet, hextet, etc. Okay, are we seeing splitting now? We're gonna actually pick up on splitting when we come. We do that. So, we're gonna pick up on splitting when we come back on Tuesday. All right. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording and let you ask questions.